Good evening. If you would, please take the Bible and open it to the book of Amos. And if you could just mark that book, I'd like to consider a few thoughts with you this evening from that book. And if you have a marker in your Bible, it might be good to do that. Very thankful for your presence, thankful for your faithfulness to the Lord that continues to bring you out on this beautiful Lord's Day. The prophet Amos was sent to the kingdom of Israel. You might recall that God's people were divided into two different nations at one time of Israel north and Judah south, and the larger kingdom being that of Israel. And it says that Amos was sent especially to this northern kingdom, which was roughly about 25 years before that kingdom would be taken into Assyrian captivity. And at this time, the people of Israel were doing well financially. They had things known as summer houses and winter houses. In chapter 3 and verse 15, God said, I will destroy the winter house along with the summer house. The houses of ivory shall perish, and the great houses shall have an end, says the Lord. So I don't care who you are or what you're going through. If you have a summer house or a winter house or an ivory house, things are going pretty well for you. Things are above the standard of the essentials. You have excess, and that's what this nation had. That There were people in this nation who had many luxuries. And it says in chapter 3 that that wasn't a fault, that wasn't a sin to have those houses. But what God was going to do was take those things away from them because they were not living up to the covenant that they had made with him. In chapter 3 it says in verses 1 and 2 that he was expecting more from them because they were his people. In verse 1, Hebrews, Amos chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O children of Israel, against the whole family which I brought up from the land of Egypt, saying, You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. So we see why God was going to do it. He had blessed them so richly. He had given them so much as a people and now they had forgotten him. Now they had done the very thing God warned against of worshiping those things more than him. I believe it's safe to say we have it very good in this nation. Yeah, we have things that are not ideal. There are things happening that we would not want to happen. But overall, we're still doing, still doing very well by many standards in the world. We have comfortable houses. You're going to go home to a climate-controlled house for the most part. Most of us have that. We have good schools. We have clean water. That is tremendous. The very fact that you and I can get water so freely and that is clean, that we can ingest without any type of threat to our health, that's tremendous. We have electricity. We have air conditioning. We have TVs, computers, phones. So many things we can do with the push of a button. We have good roads. You know, you don't think about that until you're in a place that doesn't have those things, that we are so fortunate we can go anywhere we want comfortably on safe roads. We have multiple cars in our families. We have good sanitation. What a blessing it is for trash day to come around and for that stuff to be taken off and taken care of. There are places in the world where that stuff's just thrown right, right out the back door and other types of sanitation. We're very blessed. But in light of that, I wonder if God were still speaking in diverse and various ways, if he would still speak to us today with a man like Amos. I wonder, in fact, if Amos was speaking to us as a nation with all that we're going through. I mean, you look at our standard of living. It's high. You have other nations in the world that don't have what we have. I mean, what about this Walmart 
in a different part of the world where the meat is exposed like that? How would you like to select meat like this where everybody's handling it that's just unwrapped and opened? Just like that, piled up in the store at a Walmart. We have a high standard of living here. And as I was saying, I wonder if men like Amos would be sent to speak to us today, especially as God's people who are living in a land of excellence, in a land of opulence. Or another way of asking that is, are you and I thinking the same way Israel was thinking before God sent a prophet like Amos among them? In other words, has this nation influenced our thinking? Is it affecting our morality? Is it affecting our judgment? Is it affecting our religion? Is it affecting our view of the family? Is America changing us? Well, that's what Amos did. Amos went in and he went back to the people of God and he told them his will and reminded them of the truth that he needed them to hear. Would he say the same things to us? Well... I'll just tell you what he told them, at least a few of them, and you see if there's a parallel, if a man like this would still be needed in our nation. The people of Israel, number one, were deceived by prosperity. That's one of the messages God wanted his people to hear, that their excess has created a sense of security that they should not have had. Notice what he says in Amos chapter 6, in verses 1 through 7. In Amos chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. Now here's what he says. Woe to you who are at ease in Zion and trust in Mount Samaria, notable persons in the chief nation to whom the house of Israel comes. Go over to Cana and see, and from there go to Hamath the great. Then go down to Gath to the Philistines. Are you better than these kingdoms? Or is their ter territory greater than your territory? Woe to you who put far off the day of doom, who cause the seed of violence to come near, who lie on beds of ivory, stretch out on your couches, eat lambs from your flock, and calves from the midst of the stall, who sing idly to the sound of stringed instruments and invent for yourselves musical instruments like David." who drink wine from bowls and anoint yourselves with the best ointments, but are not grieved for the affliction of Joseph. Therefore, they shall now go captive as the first of the captives, and those who recline at banquets shall be removed. Now what we see in that reading is that God is referencing other nations that had been judged for their wickedness, and he's saying, look, are you any different than them? Are you any less accountable to God than they were? and how he had judged them. And then he says that woe to you who are <clears throat> who put off the day of doom. That is, you don't believe it's coming to you. That you don't think it's going to happen to you because everything is going so well. That you have all this abundance. He says you stretch out on your beds of ivory, your, your couches. You have stringed instruments. You have wine from bowls. You have all this excess. Now let me throw this in. Sometimes people have come to Amos chapter 6 and say that this is God's way of condemning instrumental music and worship. That, that's not what he's getting at. He's not even touching on that right now. All he's simply saying is that this is one way these people were given to excess, that they were able to enjoy things like an ivory bed and a couch and stringed instruments, that they weren't conflicted with other things because they had so many things going well for them. And they could enjoy these pleasures of life. But what he's saying is that you've allowed your excess to convince you that you're not going to be judged. That you put off the day of doom, is what he says in verse 3. That when these prophets of God have come in and have told you God is expecting you to repent, you lie back and recline and you enjoy your life and you think, well, it's not going to happen. It can't happen. I've got too many things going well for me. And that leads me to the thought, as it says in verse 8, am I like that? Have I reached the point where I want too much of this world? And I love this world too much. In verse 8, the Lord God has sworn by himself, the Lord God of hosts says, I abhor the pride of Jacob and hate his palaces. 
Therefore, I will deliver up the city and all that is in it. So God is just simply saying, you love these things, but I hate them. And the reason I hate them is because of the confidence it gives you in living apart from me. That's why I hate these things. And I see things like that and I wonder, am I like that? That in my heart of hearts, do I want this world more than anything, even more than God? You know, you can't fool God, and we can't fool Jesus. He says that when it comes to loving God, the, the, the offset is what? That we either love God with all of our heart, or we are going to love what? Mammon, right? And you can't have two masters. That you're either going to love God, or you're going to love mammon. That is this earthly abundance. Now, God gives us richly all things to enjoy. We know the Bible says that. But what do we love? What do we trust? And what is in the heart of hearts? Are we like the Israelites in that we're more concerned about reclining on our couches, watching our TV, looking up things online, or being spiritually minded? And here's the thing, we cannot fool God. Notice what it says in 2 Timothy chapter 3. I mean, when I read this... I have to do a lot of soul searching to see if any of these things can be true of me today. And more often than not, they are struggles. But it says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, notice this, we, we can't fool God. He knows what's in our heart. In verse 2, he says this beginning, For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, hotters, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. I would think that what he says about being lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God would fit identical to what the people of Israel were. All those things, lovers of money. And, of course, all the things that come along with being blessed so richly, of the haughtiness and the things of an unloving nature. If God were still speaking in various ways, would he send Amos to us? Would he tell Amos the same things to tell us that he told the people of Israel of going too far and enjoying your blessings in life. Here's what he says through Amos. Going back to this book, and that's why I encourage you to mark this book. But in Amos chapter 4, God wanted his people to know he knew what was in their heart. And that's what I need to know. He knows what's in my heart. In Amos chapter 4 and verse 13, For behold, he who forms mountains and creates the wind who declares to man what his thoughts is, or what his thought is, and makes the morning darkness who treads the high places of the earth. The Lord God of hosts is his name. He knows our thoughts. He knows what's in there. In chapter 6 it says in verse 8, again, the Lord has sworn him by himself, the Lord God of hosts, I abhor the pride of Jacob and hate his palaces. Therefore I will deliver up the city and all that is in it. Very sobering thought. But to me, it's not too far of a stretch, at least to give us the same message and warning as Amos did these people. Well, let's keep going, because there's a whole lot in Amos. I'm, not, I'm just scratching the surface tonight. But when you keep looking at Amos, there's a couple other things worth noting. See if this is true for us today in our world. One of the problems they had is they could not distinguish between evil and good. And that is, they were calling evil good and good evil. Is that still a problem? They, they, they could not decipher the truth, and when the truth was presented, they did not want to hear it. In Amos chapter 5, notice where it says in verse 10, and then along with verses 14 and 15, but Amos chapter 5, here's what he says. They hate the one who rebukes in the gate, and they abhor the one who speaks uprightly. Does that still happen? If anybody comes in and says, this is the way God wants us to live, and this is the only way we can live, 
and be right with him, is that going to cause a problem? Is that going to ruffle feathers in our society? In verses 14 and 15, God says, Seek good and not evil, that you may live. So the Lord God of hosts will be with you as you have spoken. Hate evil, love good, establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. So they were, they were, they were messed up. They, 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 were, they were upholding the wrong things. They, things that God considered evil, they were saying good. And the things that God said were good, they thought were evil. And they were confusing the two. And anybody who tried to tell them this is God's will and that we're to avoid certain things, that person was abhorred. That person was rejected. Is that a problem? You know, a, a hundred plus years after Amos was the man Isaiah. And Isaiah was preaching to Judah. And they were going through the very same thing right before they went off into captivity. And it says in Isaiah chapter 5, and I know you've heard these words, but it still was true for them. In Isaiah chapter 5, notice where he says in verses 20 through 23, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. So what's happening? You have people who were upholding things God said don't uphold, and they were condemning things God said were good. In verse 21, Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Woe to men who make mighty, or men, woe to men mighty at drinking wine. Woe to men valiant for mixing intoxicating drink, who justify the wicked for a bribe and take away justice from the righteous man. And I'm just simply asking, does that even have any resemblance to what we're up against? I mean, is there even a slight chance of this same mentality affecting us today because of our excess and because things are going so well for us as a nation? Here's what I wrestle with more than anything when I read a prophet like Amos. And that is, am I being influenced? Has this nation changed my thinking? Or really, has it made me a thinker of things that are contrary to God? That is, do I view things acceptable that God condemns? Or do I condemn things that God says are good? What about religion? What does the New Testament say? What did Jesus say? That he came and he was going to build what? His church. And what does the Bible say about that? There is one Lord, one faith, one hope, one baptism. Go down the list. That's what the Bible says. But if you and I preach a message of singularity that there is a way to serve God, that there is an acceptable way to serve Him, and that there are unacceptable things to Him in religion, what happens? We were born into a society that says, live and let live. That's the world we inherited. And we've been raised around that ideology. Has it affected us? Has it changed us? Do we really think that it doesn't matter to God what we do and believe and practice in religion? Or are we on the same page as him in there being one? How much is one? How much is one? One Lord, one faith, one hope, one baptism. How much is one? Well, if I understand it correctly, it's more than zero and less than two, right? One. But that's not a message that's going to go over too well in our society and even in some of our thinking, myself included. Has America changed me? Has America influenced how God defines the family? Or at least how we view God's definition of the family. Is America teaching me how to mistreat my family? Or how to structure my family and in the home? Does that matter to me? And really, what about this one? You tell me, is sexuality a problem in our world? or really even in our nation, but our world as a whole. I'm concerned. I'm really concerned. I wonder 
if we are having an epidemic and don't even realize it because of the immorality that is just so freely accessible to people of all ages. Younger and younger people are seeing things they have no business seeing because of technology. And I, I just wonder how that has changed our thinking in terms of sexuality. But here's the thing we have to keep in mind. There are things that God says are evil that we have to avoid, and there are things that God says are good and we must uphold. And we can't confuse the two. But the problem is this. We have an aggressive campaign against us to change our thinking. Now, I'm going to illustrate this. I could, there's a million ways I could illustrate this, but here's, here's a good one. Used to be Kellogg's was about cereal, right? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's cereal with cereal. But now, there's politics in almost everything around us, even breakfast cereals. I mean, when you see that there's a cereal from this company that is promoting a certain lifestyle, we've got issues. Something's happening around us when breakfast cereals are used to promote an agenda to influence the way people view sexuality. We're talking about cereal here. And yet cereal is not the only thing being used. You know as well as I do, there are cartoons, there are books, there are shows, there are songs. Everything around us is trying to get our thinking twisted. Now, here's the thing. We understand that sin is sin. And the sin of homosexuality is no different than any other sin in the sense that it condemns us before God. I understand that. You understand that. And that it is a sin that can be forgiven. Any sin can be forgiven. So I'm not suggesting anything like that in illustrating this point. But what I do want us to see from this, and I'm sure you're a hundred miles ahead of me already on this, there's an aggressive campaign to change our thinking. As if to say it is good for men to be with men and women to be with women or for men to want to become women or women to become men, it is a good thing that that happens. That's the world we live in. And if we oppose that, then we are the evil ones. We are the bad ones. And I'm just simply saying, has that changed us? Is the world changing how we view God and His will? Because you and I can argue a thousand years with our neighbors about whether or not they should engage in this activity or whether or not you should engage in this activity. But the bottom line is, God has already said, there is nothing you can do to convince his mind to accept this behavior. He's already spoken this. There is no way we can convince God to change his thinking on this behavior. He will never condone it. And so what he tells us is that in regard to this sin and any other sin like it, we have to be people who stand on the same page with him in opposing these things. Not that we don't love our neighbors or our family who engage in this. That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is approval. Do we approve of things God does not approve? That's the issue. In Romans chapter 1, that's what Paul is saying in verses 28 through 32. It's not just doing these things. Yes, we may struggle with these desires and these activities. That may be a real struggle for you. It's not about the activity alone. It's about whether or not we're going to consider it a good thing or an evil thing the way God does. In Romans chapter 1, the Bible says this in verses 28 through 32. Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness, they are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors, of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. 
And that, my friends, is a real struggle. Because that's exactly what Israel was doing. Israel was approving these things. Israel was condoning these things and was condemning the person who said otherwise. Amos, I believe, would have some work to do in our nation. And it's something to consider. But let me say one last thing from Amos, if I may. And that is, in regard to his work, the bottom line is he was dealing with the people who were unprepared for judgment. And that's what God sent him in there to say. In Amos chapter 6, these people just did not believe it was going to happen. And here's the thing. They didn't think it was going to happen, but within 25 years, they would be carried off into captivity and their nation would come to an end. It was coming. Amos chapter 6 and verse 3, again, he says, Woe to you who put far off the day of doom, who caused the seed of violence to come near. Again, they, there's just no way. I've got this winter house, I've got this summer house, I've got this ivory palace, I've got this couch at home, I've got the bowl of wine, I've got the stringed instruments. Things are going way too well for me to lose this stuff. And within 25 years, it was gone. Are we 25 years away from coming to an end as a nation? I don't know. But are we within 25 years of judgment? I mean, is it possible for us to do the same thing, to put off the day of judgment, where God tells us He's going to judge all of mankind? And are we not tempted to run to our device, run to our vacation, run to our work, run to our friends, and dismiss the day of judgment, thinking it will not happen anytime soon? In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10, it says, We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. We don't know when it's coming. And since we don't know when it's coming, every moment I need to be a person who is humble and who is seeking God's mercy and who is striving to be holy and righteous as he is. Because it was coming for Israel, whether they wanted to accept it or not. And God had a fascinating way of showing it to these people. There are many times in this prophet's work that God warned them through him. And he gave them a fascinating illustration in Amos chapter 7. Many illustrations were used, but I thought this one really stood out. Because here's what God said to these people through this man in Amos chapter 7. And I have it up here, <clears throat> verses 7 through 9. He says, He showed me... Behold, the Lord stood on a wall made with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, Behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will not pass by them anymore. The high places of Isaac shall be desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. I will rise with the sword against the house of Jeroboam. Now, I'm very, very limited when it comes to construction. Very limited. But I think we all can understand the concept of a plumb line. That a plumb line is a string that has a weight at the bottom. And that the person would hold the plumb line to give a true line of what was vertical. The true reading. That which is true. And when you had a wall or a structure and you were trying to see if it was level or if it was square you'd use a plumb line and it would show you how it compares to the truth and what God is saying is look I'm holding a plumb line to my people Israel and the thing about a plumb line is it always gives the truth and it does it impartially it doesn't matter what effort you put forth and all your emotions and money and all that you think about your structure it doesn't matter it's impartial it shows the truth whether you you want it or not and what God was saying is, I have this plumb line and I'm showing my people that they are not square with me. They may think they are and they may think they're okay, but from what I'm seeing, they're not balanced and they're condemned. And I'm going to judge my people for being out of sync with me. Now I see that and I see a great comparison for us. 
I mean, God measures us by His Word. And the thing about God's Word is it's always true and it's always impartial. It doesn't matter what you think about it. It doesn't matter what your friends think about it. It doesn't matter what emotions you have invested in what you and I are doing. It, do it doesn't matter. The Word just shows the truth. And God judges us impartially. He tells us that. Do you know that this book is going to be on the final exam? The Word of God, it, we're going to stand before God and He's going to open His book and judge us. It's an open book exam. And He's letting us know right now, I am impartial. It doesn't matter how much you've given. It doesn't matter how much you think about yourself or what people say about you. It all gets down to how you and I stand in relation to that Word. And it says in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 17, if you call on the Father who without partiality, well, God, look how much I've given to you. Look how much I've sacrificed for you. Certainly you can overlook this one little mistake or this one little compromise. He's, he's impartial. If you call on the Father who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear. That is respecting God. Are we still in alignment with God? Has my changing or has my thoughts changed because of society? And so I share these thoughts with us, good friends. You, you, you've listened very patiently and I do appreciate that. But when I read the prophets, I just see so many parallels to what you and I are going through. And I wonder that's, if that's why God recorded them is for us to see the very same events in our own life. And I can see a lot of things happening in Amos to make me wonder, would he be a prophet for America today? Or was he a prophet to what America is like today? It's something worth considering. Thank you, friends. May, uh, may you go back and read this book for yourself and, and see all the fascinating lessons God taught through him. But if you're here and you're not a child of God, we like to give you the truth. And the truth is that God has a special way of saving people from sin. And that's, of course, through His Son. And that is a very distinct way of being saved from sin. And we hope that you have found it and you're ready to obey it tonight. If you don't know it, we ask you for an opportunity. But if you're ready, we're singing this song to encourage you to come to the Lord, die to your sins, be buried with him in baptism and raised to walk in newness of life. And we hope you would do that. If you need to make things right with God in any way, please come to him as we stand and sing.